to our world over initially i mentioned good evening because we are calling from india but our brothers and sisters across the world wherever they are we extend them a very warm welcome it's a pleasure to have all of them with us and today we have got a very special guest dr devashish c bhattacharya ji he is the consultant pediatric surgeon and head of the department uh, sultan kuabus hospital in the beautiful state and the country called oman today we have got very important subject very important theme walking beyond the covid ruins we have come a long way we started on 25th of march 2020 and now today when we all are meeting it is 17th of june 2021 it's a one year long journey but we worked very hard and today is the 984th webinar during this pandemic what a large family what a big family and all of us together from world over in this particular program we are proud of all our brothers and sisters across the world wherever they are it's indeed a great great pleasure to have all of you having being a part of our journey so ladies and gentlemen let me share with you today is a world day to combat when you particularly called about desertification and drought 17th of june 2021 as per united nation is being dedicated and devoted to this desertification and drought our chamber icsi international chamber for service industry which is a link between india and almost 31 million plus indians abroad indian diaspora those are doing great great job during the covid ladies and gentlemen we all have been impacted affected our jobs have been affected our work has been hampered our schools have been affected our health has been affected whether physical or mental or environmental or spiritual whatever is there the world has got shaken up you know and thereby the new world order is coming we all are learning to live with the new norms the new ways and covid is having a devastating impact on our children and on our education ecosystem now when you talk about uh, wellness yes wellness to be the integral part of our education ecosystem it's very important there are eight dimensions of the wellness when you talk about emotional spiritual intellectual physical environmental financial occupational and of course we have got social all that when we take into consideration these are the eight dimensions of wellness our chamber wholeheartedly believes after a lot of research and a thorough studies that the holistic education is the future where education skills and the outcome of these two have to be blended and there is a 100% accountability why do i study a particular subject why do i go to school why do i go to college why do i learn a particular skill so all that is very important and we sometimes wonder and we are very strongly recommended from our chamber from time to time that why don't we make you know the the education of fun why don't we make it more creative where music dances games happiness humor creativity curiosity fun storytelling stimulation following your own passion talent exhibition stress free education technology based education vocational and skill based education outdoor activities and nature based education why do not we adopt this strategy where education should be relevant to my day to day living my day to day life we are proud to share with all the brothers and sisters those are joining us world over that our chamber brought india's first finishing school for service industry way back in 1994 today we have started talking about soft skills and life skills and talent management and talent exhibition whatever is there when you exhibit all these things we have been talking about all this for the last about 27 years our chamber has taken initiative in a very humble way 
we are going to offer free education to children whose parents cannot afford it will be e gurukul gyan yagya when you talk about gyan yagya that means the education yagya so thereby every child who ever is keen to get some kind of a quality education our chamber will be working in that particular direction during last year and this year we are dedicating totally to teachers and youth empowerment and if india has to become atmanirbhar bharat we got to account everybody irrespective whether they are in villages they are in cities they are in rural they are in urban they are semi urban whatever it is everybody has to be empowered and everybody has to be given hand holding now we are organizing almost 28 webinars per week we are proud of all this and we are moving ahead and we are having lots of programs and creativity being packed together where you have got deliberations celebrations jubilations what shall you talk about every day 8 pm we bring a special program for you under the series of making education relevant and nowadays we are talking about vocational education and skills over there we are taking soft skills and life skills under soft skills we take on different themes and today we are going to talk about art of decision making what is the art how do you take this season and this particular pandemic has taught us one thing the world is getting back to the base that means the basic normals are going to be very important we got to hop on them we got to mount on them and we got to move on with them so basic food basic health basic education sustainable development and finally what so a human mind can conceive and believe it can achieve we all can achieve what so wish we extend a very hearty welcome to dr devashish c bhattacharya ji consultant pediatric surgeon and head of the department sultan kabus hospital oman dr bhattacharya ji his vision driven he is highly accomplished surgeon and administrator with over 25 years of experience and a proven track record of delivering the world class health services to patients as well as to hospital now he possesses a comprehensive background in the healthcare management health laws health regulations personal management training and development and overseeing the medical related legal and judicial litigations for the ministry of health uh, sultanat of the oman so that we have not to forget we should basically take into consideration as a human being as a humanity all of us together what we can do to make this world getting back to normal at the earliest and contributing something substantial in the service of this universe ladies and gentlemen he is actively involved in quality control and quality improvement for sultan kabus hospital currently he is working on multiple projects with the swedish and uh, finnish government that means finland government as an accredited administrator and facilitator wishbone trust research fellow awardee royal college of surgeon in edinburgh that is next to the glasgow next to the scotland we used to travel a lot by train from particularly glasgow to edinburgh now another very important area vascular fellowship from the university of birmingham uk so ladies and gentlemen it's really a very privileged moment for all of us that how do we walk beyond the covid ruins or whatever difficulties even the minor whatever you are experiencing at this point of time today our manthan our discussion our deliberations and our periphery is somewhere walking beyond the corona virus and join me in extending a very warm welcome to dr devashish c bhattacharya consultant and pediatric surgeon and head of the department sultan kabus hospital oman so ladies and gentlemen it's a proud privilege to have dr bhattacharya with us and let's take our vision forward let's take uh, our journey forward and i'm grateful to prema murli dharji she had been very kind to put across 
to Dr. Devashish Ji, and he had been very kind in spite of doctors having a very best busy schedule nowadays. But he told, I'll cut down my sacrifice, uh, my sleep, no problem. Let's dedicate and devote some time for the humanity. So, ladies and gentlemen, with these words, we extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Devashish Bhattacharyaji on this platform. We are really privileged to have him and we wish to learn and pick up more from his vision, his expertise and his know-how, what all can be done to make this world a better place. Dr. Devashish C. Bhattacharyaji. Um, first and foremost, uh, as I would say, I would like to say, Sir Mastak Chukakar Hindi me, because predominantly I'm addressing my own countrymen, people from my motherland, the land where I was born. I took my first breath, my first steps. That's India. And wherever I go, whatever I do, whomsoever I spend my time with, the Indian in me can never be, you know, uh, forgotten can never be prevented from expression. So to every noble soul in my motherland, I offer my pranams, most heartiest, grateful salams to Major Gulshanji Sharmaji. Sir, you are a very, very kind person. And you have heaped a humongous Everest of praise and good words for me. I'm a very small soul. You are the true son of India. You are, you are the brave son of India. I just follow in your footsteps. And I try, you, you people, you've given your life. So we slept in peace to wake up to today as we are and feel proud to be an Indian. Our pride is your gift to us, sir. So my pranams to you, sir. My pranams Thank you. to you. Thank you, sir. And uh, to Prema Ji, as I said, she's an amazingly kind woman, a great friend. She's like, a, like, a, like an elder confidant. I've been associated with her for quite some time. She used to be a very senior faculty in the Indian school, Salala, where I was the chairman and president of the management board as well. So Prema Ji, my heart goes out to you and a heartfelt thank you to you for putting me in the August company of Major Gulshanji Sharma. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, both of you. Uh, my friends from all over the world, now you are going to be dealing with a surgeon here. And let's forget the frills and the drills of consultant and head of the department and blah, blah, and blue, blue. Those are all ornaments that we pick up in our life for social and I would say economic existence. Let's, let's talk as human to human, man to man and a person to person. So you're going to be dealing with a surgeon. A surgeon is a, basically a very aggressive personality, but his aggression is always a controlled aggression, a controlled aggression for a constructive outcome. So I'm going to have a very constructive and yet at times borderline aggressive attitude to what we need to do to walk beyond the COVID-19 pandemic ruins. Why do I call it ruins? I call it ruins. Because the world ex was exposed to COVID in December 2019. If you remember, the first time, I think it was the 23rd or the 21st of December, when the news leaked around the world about a Wuhan laboratory virus escaping, blah, blah. Hosts and series and legends of conspiracy theories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's not waste our time on that. Let's come to the nitty gritty. God knows from where it came, but it has come, it has settled, it has established, and it's pretty much ruined the world. The COVID virus, and the COVID virus is a great, great equalizer. It has flattened the curve for everybody. The rich or the poor, the fat or the thin, the big or the small, the old or the young, it has not spared anybody and it has treated everybody with due diligence, you know, exact amount of intelligence, exam, exact amount of love and care, and it hasn't spared anybody. 
So what am I trying to do today? I'm going to be trying to be different because I believe unless we all become different, we all start thinking differently, we all start looking differently, we all start working differently, we all start approaching the current issue in hand differently, we will not only be able, uh, or we won't be able to make either a difference in our own lives or in the difference of lives of people who really matter. And whether they are our own next of kin and the same blood or people totally alien, unknown in some remote corner, but where our action has an impact on their lives. So moving to the COVID pandemic. How do I describe the COVID pandemic? As I said before, post December 19, the world was never the same. The seesaw of balance of every, every relevant element of existence of human civilization, whether it was human life, whether it was commerce, whether it was trade, whether it was the social or the economic or the, the psychological or the health wise, every component of human life and human civilization, the, the seesaw was turned upside down. Suddenly COVID was up and the world was down. And there was not a single iota or aspect of human civilization which wasn't affected by the sudden unanticipated attack or the onslaught of the pandemic. Nobody, no, I mean, of course, the, the exposure, the involvement, and the, you know, the onslaught of that attack gradually moved, but eventually it was encompassing the whole human civilization. Some directly, some indirectly, but everybody was getting impacted. Now, uh, Major Saab has been very, you know, he, I, I, I really love the way he presented. You know, I mean, he is a very wise man, as I said. In six or eight minutes, he covered everything. I am a mundane soul, a little coarse, dense guy. So I'm going to be going. I, I am not as versatile as him. I won't be able to cover all the areas. But I will just tell you, I will just throw a couple of snapshots. And I'll tell you what happened when COVID pandemic happened. This is my the first casualty. Any, As I said, anybody and everybody suddenly was attacked by the virus. And I'm going to focus on two important areas today, the healthcare system and the education system. And the rest of the things, there are much more wiser people in this world, people packed with knowledge, wisdom, intelligence, and multidimensional thinking abilities who would any day do a better job than me. But I feel what happened is suddenly, everybody was in a quandary. Everybody was in a state of chaos. Everybody was, was in a state of absolutely unheard of, unanticipated, unbelievable fear. Because a person walking, talking, and bringing food to the table to everybody at home suddenly was having pipes jutting out of his system, attacked by an alien you know, pathogen or virus, and was fighting for his life. Whether it was the breadwinning father, or the supporting mother, or the elder brother, or anybody and everybody in the house, the patriarch, the matriarch, whatever, suddenly people found themselves at the receiving end, and their relatives, their near and dear ones, being put in a situation to take a decision whether to keep them alive or plug off the ventilator. Imagine the predicament, the traumatic, nightmarish mental makeup of everybody. And equally, the healthcare system, suddenly everybody involved in the healthcare, whether it was the doctor, the nurse, the paramedic, the healthcare supporting ancillary staff, suddenly what were they doing? They were, do they were dealing with people who came in apparently looking healthy, deteriorating very rapidly and probably getting packed up in a body bag. And again, going off and not being disposed of in an honorable, civil, social manner. Because people didn't know what killed whom, where, how, and why. So the healthcare system was one system which took the 
most brutal of Muhammad Ali punches, the knockout punch, as they would say, the tiger knockout punch. Health care system who had the first system, it was the front line. Because when people fall sick, the only person they run to is a medic or a doctor or a physician. And irrespective of the, the kind of pathy he is practicing. So healthcare took the first brunt as a professional. And the next came the source of livelihood. Suddenly, when people started falling sick, the natural response of the human population is people want to isolate themselves. They want to get away. They want to be isolated. But if you isolate, that doesn't put food on your plate. That doesn't make the world tick. The clock doesn't stop ticking because you are not feeling like working. So the entire corporate structure overnight took a knee-jerk response let us get out of our normal office environment and let us start working away. Let us get scattered and let us start doing things away remotely from distant location to keep the output going. But it sounds very exciting. It sounds very interesting. But remember the human mind, sudden conditioned reflexes, if they are suddenly tugged or pulled, for the human mind and the system and for everybody to adjust, acclimatize or adapt is a time consuming process. And it doesn't happen overnight. So even the corporate setups who were suddenly kind of disengaged or decentralized from an office based working environment to a work from home scenarios, there were also a lot of performance-related casualties, and also work outcome, work output, and work performance-related deficiencies. These were the observations. The third casualty, the third casualty is, it's as simple. If the farmer doesn't grow enough food, he doesn't have enough food for his folks at home, he doesn't have any enough of food to go and sell in the market. There is a scarcity, there is a shortage. And there's a whole cycle start. The same way, when the offices closed or they were working at, you know, semi or half or minimalistic output scenarios, obviously nobody likes to pay somebody for doing nothing. So whether the employer was government or private or multinational or corporate or whatever, there was obviously unemployment and laying off or retrenchment of staff happening all over the world. Now, when this happens, you have to understand, yes, for one segment, which is laying off people for his or her own survival, there is an equally other half segment, which is losing its form of survival its source of livelihood. So survival balance gets jittery and gets tantalized on both sides. It's a very complicated situation. So unemployment to the person who's been rendered jobless is a nightmare. And equally for the other person who's rendering somebody off his job, he has to do it, it is mandatory for him if he needs to survive within his limited available corpus of financial co you know, uh, quorum. So it's a, it's a cash 22 like situation which emanated. And those who didn't lose their jobs, they had to you know, undergo the snipe of the scissor or the knife. And that was in the form of wage cuts, salary cuts, perquisites cuts, lot of services being withdrawn, etc., cetera, et cetera. So these were the four immediate casualties after the COVID pandemic in any and every sphere. And what did it expose? It exposed a very fragile component of the social ecosystem. Trust me, my friends, 
it's only three to five or maximally stretched in the advanced countries, 7% of the population, which is sincerely well-to-do, very well comfortable, very well catered to, has a good buffer or a cushion to sustain immediate unanticipated crisis period. There is another seven to 10% of the population, which is below the poverty line at any given point of time, but there is a large segment which just about keeps floating. And when a pandemic like this happens, these, whether there is a job cut or a wage cut, it is this fragile segment of the population which got badly exposed. They got very, very badly exposed because they already had a lot of overheads, but they were just about juggling and you know balancing the whole financial dynamics or gimmicks of jugglery of financial you know, inputs versus outputs, and they were just about surviving. But when that apple cart got a little, the wheels of the apple cart got tossed around a bit, suddenly they sunk under the weight of it. And add to it that they also were forced to care for their very own lives, either themselves or of their next of kin. And here we were combating an unknown medical virus, unknown therapies, all running by trial and experimental methods. So obviously there was no price banding, no cost limitation. And there was, you know, there were places where, where sky was the limit being charged just to give you a few more days of life. And not always it was working. It was a trial and error method going on in the first few months all over the world. Everybody knows it. Even I as a doctor, we shouldn't be ashamed to say that even today, can anybody standing on this universe put his thumb on, the, on a piece of paper and say, this, this, this is the only treatment modality of COVID pandemic. Nobody can say. It's all trial and error. This works, this doesn't work. This works on some, this doesn't work on some. This has been tried. In him, it worked like magic, but this fellow died. And forget about rest. Forget about the therapies, the vaccines. The vaccines were supposed to be the magic broom on, who, on, on riding on which the world was to fly in perennial safety. Now, even after the vaccines, so many, people, so many people suffered side effects, whether they are proven of the vaccine or manifestations generated after vaccination. Still, nobody has an answer. And we got to be honest in accepting it, that here we are dealing with an enigma. So as I said, I'm going to be talking about these two areas, but I'm not going to be boring my audience with technical or scientific details of the treatment or this, because believe me, every, you know, every sane, mentally competent, intelligent enough to understand, even little bit educated, or I would say, you know, socially and, you know, I would say knowledge-wise, smart or, you know, aware enough individual has suffered one problem, that is information overload about COVID. Whether you open the telephone, the, the, the computer screen, the television, or any form of media and communication, one thing which has happened unabated in a wholesome manner is information overload. And unfiltered, at times, uh, you know, adulterated, unchecked, unverified, unsubstantiated, information overload. This is a flip side of the information highway of COVID pandemic. Coming to talk about health, good health is a key part of our quality of life. And they say that, you know, that publicly funded healthcare is the legacy of the age of enlightenment. Why I put this statement in a red color is because Publicly funded healthcare. It's a brilliant concept. 
people talk of government and you know public sector and private sector partnerships people talk of public uh, you know the the community or the private sector stakes in government run healthcare facilities so that they are better enhanced financially supported more extensive in their outreach catering to a wider segment of the community blah blah so many things but let me tell you again as a doctor a bitter truth the 20th century was a century of renaissance as far as advanced modern medicine is concerned most of the things right from 1953 when alexander fleming 51 or 53 fleming discovered penicillin penicillin from penicillin notatum to today where we stand some epoch making discoveries formulations therapeutic modalities and all have been initiated in the human civilization from all over the world but the real acute and you know rapid strides and advancement of healthcare has happened in the last 30 40 years to the point that we have reached a stage that you know you you lose an arm we put you a bionic arm you lose a leg we put a bionic leg your heart doesn't work we change your heart your liver doesn't work we change your liver your kidneys don't function we change your kidney i'm waiting for the day when you get up in the morning and you realize that your brains are not good enough and your face doesn't look here so lord ganesha may be actually you know replicated in the human civilization <laughs> you know i mean even for a for a for a disastrous guy like me i can just walk into xyz location and get a hair as curly as kenny logins or you know um, uh, lionel richie and you know i can do anything this is medicine today last 30 40 years they can change everything about you you see i always always tell my son that look my dear boy you cannot change your father and mother but we are in 21st century you can keep changing your father in law and mother in law every week you know so it is it is how things are that that's the 21st century so that's how things move but then the healthcare even the apple cart or the seesaw of healthcare system all over the world has taken a terrible bashing and why is that because the corona pandemic which came so sudden so anticipated unanticipated so unpredicted so uncalled for it was like a stealth bomber the american stealth bombers which can just avoid even supersonic or ultrasonic radar detection and they can just come through the you know the the the, the sheer darkness of the night they can do carpet bombing and disappear and next day in the morning when you get up your days that everything is flattened this was how corona pandemic hit the world and the entire healthcare system of the world was stripped bare and what did it show it showed how inadequate and how inequitable was the distribution of healthcare system and services all over the world because what did the exposed look appear and i'm sure if there are people who are healthcare promoters and healthcare operators and healthcare owners facility owners they must be getting a little uncomfortable as they hear me talk but that's the truth the bitter naked truth every location every happening place in the world is loaded with five and seven star facility loaded hospitals because healthcare is now a very very commercially viable operation healthcare has become a big big money spinner healthcare is a lucrative business proposition and these hospitals they are palaces they are dream homes they promise healing pain with pleasure they have every facility every gadget every modality available and virtually every dreamt of therapy as i said we are in the age of completely changing you all over whether you want immunoglobulins whether you want gene therapy whether you need to be cloned 
or whether you need complete re, re, you know, remake. We do it only for a price tag. But the flip side is all these therapies are very, very expensive. So very small segment of the people can afford it. So those without insurance coverage or you know, those who cannot afford it, for them it's just a utopian dream. And honestly, it's only for the rich and famous to a large extent. Because the flip side of the coin, my dear friends, especially talking about the Indian scenario, our primary health care system is very, very malnourished. It's like a dehydrated child suffering from cholera. And her, the mother, which is the system, which is responsible for that, yeah, is instead of giving, you know, electrol water, electrolyte solution, is giving rice water kanji. A few paltry inputs and expecting a huge rural population to be catered. Absolutely misplaced and misdirected resource. And why do I say that? I say that with authenticity and integrity. Because for the last couple of years, or rather several years, I've been traveling all over the world through organizations which hire, you know, not so good or not so capable, maybe surgeons like me to go and operate children and people free of cost. And I've been traveling the world. I've been doing a lot of charitable pro bono work. I've visited India. I've visited the healthcare system. There are major issue, issues of access and outreach for the people. We have fantastic plans and ideas on paper, my friend. But how much of them are actually in existence? There's a gap between the lip and the cup. Lack of ownership and lack of responsible governance or accountability. Complete, and all these things are not my figment of imagination. They were all revealed absolutely stark open at the, you know, when the pandemic really hit, hit the entire country or in most of the countries. It's not just India specific. In most of the developing nations or the third world nations, all these things were woefully exposed when the pandemic hit. The US says that healthcare expenditure is a major form of expenditure. But then, US had, you all know about the Obamacare and the Medicare and the Medicaid and all that. Even they, as the most advanced nation in the world, their healthcare system was very, very openly and very threadbarely exposed as a result of this pandemic. So the pandemic, as I keep on saying, was a great equalizer. Now, what is the way out? Because the bottom line is the pants down effect. And we all, including people like me, we are all in it together. We all are both suffering and sufferers. And we have also contributed to the suffering because we haven't kept ourselves geared up, ready, and well adapted to handle suddenly a, a kind of a catastrophe or a calamity of such magnitude and proportions. So I think it's time to work on it. We have to stop wasting time. Let me tell you, certain things have to stop. And this is globally, my message is globally. Let's not, let's not waste any more time. I mean, of course, research, evidence-based medicine, research backing scientific data, all these are very integral components. But let us come out of the blame game. There is still a persisting, lingering blame game on a lot of things which is going on, which is stalling the true progress, the true forward march of scientific dominance over this relentless virus. That needs to be withdrawn. Political shenanigans need to take a back seat. For a change, politicians have to allow, you know, if the, if the people survive, they are going to vote X, Y, Z in power. Without people, without people, there are no votes. 
if politics has to survive in the human civilization, the people have to be kept alive. Most important thing is, another is the, the dissipation of information. Now, these are all I'm talking in the backdrop of healthcare because the most crucial and the most truthful reality of everybody's life, whether it is mine or major subs or anybody is, you know, I am born as a matter of coincidence. But if I am born, I'm going to die. That's a reality. I cannot challenge the reality that if I am born, I will not die. So the most fearful thing for every human person in this world is death. And COVID-19 has given a kiss of death to anybody and everybody wholeheartedly. And some people called media, journalists, or whatever, whatever, have really run every Shakespeare, Byron, and Keating classic through their journalistic, I would say, you know, deliverances or their, you know, their, their expletive performances in generating mass hysteria, mass panic. I mean, I get amazed at the extent of yellow journalism all over the world, where people come out with sunsunny cage khabar, kya aapko pata hai? They rattle your bones, telling 200 dead bodies seen floating in the Ganges, 20 people died after a shot of vaccine. Hello, where are we reaching? TRP ratings are more important than people cowering and shivering and shaking in fear and in solitude and in the dark corners of their house. Are we really coming to that point of existence? Is a question I don't find an answer to. Similar is the race of vaccines. If Pfizer is, is the first vaccine to hit the market, AstraZeneca talks about something about Pfizer. Pfizer realizes, I'm just, again, it is not intentional. I'm just quoting it as an example. So I don't want the manufacturers of Pfizer or AstraZeneca filing legal suits on me. I'm just saying, let me use the word A and B. Supposing A vaccine comes in the market, and B is a little late in entering. So B starts probing what are the side effects of A and highlighting them. So it creates a platform for it. Come on, we are talking, we are dealing of human lives. Similarly, there are so many research papers apparently floating in the A, which regularly get counter attacked, disproved, or even labeled fake in circulation, which you all are exposed to. As a doctor, I have a better and a wider access to such so-called floating scientific material. I cannot say on a forum because there may be a lot of sensitive people here, but believe me, I am in that part of the world where vaccination still not has found acceptance amongst a lot of, I am based in Middle East. I'm based in Sultanate of Oman, as Major Saab said. There are so many, you know, compounded rumors circulated like absolute Australian bushfires that still the acceptance of vaccination is just about 50 or 60 percent. And people are reluctant. They feel if you take the vaccine, you will become sterile. You will get deformed. You will get this. You will get that. And it's 2021. So as I said, a very worried, disturbed population, a very challenged, very financially hassled majority middle class. So the, the situation is we are at the end of a tunnel, all of us, the worldwide, we are at the end of a tunnel. And what is our mental makeup? Everybody is wondering, and this is an honest confession, even I ask myself, though I I feel I'm a doctor and I'm supposed to be born wise. I'm not. I'm a very ordinary, at times, borderline silly or stupid person because I don't understand a lot of things in this world. But I'll tell you very honestly, 
I always, even I feel at the end of the day, is there light at the end of the tunnel? When is this ordeal going to end? When is life going to return to normal? For two years, you know, I can show you, see the mark on my nasal bridge. It is from an N95 mask. My, you know, it is, life has suddenly become so claustrophobic, so limiting. When, when, you know, I come out like a boiled potato every day, I have to step into a PP and go into the theater and operate for eight or 10 hours. I come out like a boiled potato. My social life is a zero. It's reduced to nothing. So I also wonder when it will be over. So there are five stages that are recommended. Resolve, resilience, return, reimagination, and reform. These are the five steps which, in my humble opinion, seriously can bring about a change in the healthcare scenario of the corona pandemic. We have to move from wartime to peacetime. And this is influenced or my source of inspiration is the McKinsey and companies, you know, this, this is a masterly article. And they have produced this right in the beginning of COVID. And I was fortunate to get my hands on it and read it. A dear friend of mine actually shared a very interesting thought today. And she mentioned, she's, she herself is also a pediatrician. I'm a surgeon. I chop chop babies. She heals, heals the babies. So she's a pediatrician from Delhi. And she mentioned about the Japanese example. And she said, humans created Hiroshima. Humans also rebuilt it. So I don't think it's impossible to turn around this year. So what do we need to do? Everybody has to stand up and become a leader. Now, it's not that you start gathering people or forcing people to start following you to, and acknowledge you as a leader. Start by leading your own self. Be your own leader first. Be your own leader. Once you become your own leader, the people in your immediate vicinity, within your family or within your household, will start looking up to you and you then expand your circle of leadership. And when they perpetuate and propagate your good ideas, you expand your leadership you know, expert expertise to other people. So this is what I feel that the expectations and needs of individuals, especially the citizens, consumers, everybody has to be given an, uh, an opportunity to express. There's a lot of repression. There's a lot of hands down, dictatorial, autocratic, you know, very, very dictatorial, you know, governance going on. You have to do this. You can't, you can't avoid this. You have to get vaccinated. You have to stand up here. You have to go there. You can't do this. No, try to give people an opportunity to express themselves. Resilience and product, I mean, the healthcare expenditure needs to be redefined, redesigned, redirected, reprogrammed, reframed and reconstructed in a direction of more of wider coverage of a wider section of the society than remaining restricted to niche segments of the population. Rather than thinking of cosmetic surgery, beautification procedures, aesthetic surgery, think of mass vaccination, mass community, you know, uh, nutritional development programs, mass hydration or rehydration programs, so many things they can be redirected. And trust me, they can equally be revenue generated. Up and down care shift across modalities. We need to go into an exponential improvement modality or methodology or mode using technology. A lot of things have not been incorporating advanced digital or related technology in disposal of healthcare. We need to move there. This is a picture diagram. And this very clearly says reforms health. It's basically a pictorial representation of what I'm trying to do. This is the McKinsey model, again, similar to what I just said. Now that was about healthcare. So what, what is the take home message in healthcare? 
take home message in healthcare is number 1 learn to live learn to survive as a responsible person life can be led by your own whims and fancies but throwing caution to win disregard for time tested widely publicized widely recommended guidelines of social and hygienic behavior will not cost anyone else except you all your pennies not just a penny if you survive if you stay healthy you will live to wake up to another day and even if money is lost you can earn it back if your health is safe so one has to stand up the government has to take note of the fact that at this point of time we need to have an expanded system of healthcare just as we have an expanded program of immunization people have to cut across their normal barriers of differences of opinion ideology thought process and they have to work together people who matter people who administer and people who take the important decisions dissipation and dissemination of information related to healthcare episodes whether tragic or happy or successful has to be controlled and has to be kind of done with a great degree of restraint caution as well as sensible interference coming to education before covid 19 life was a song and schools and colleges were doing so well education like healthcare was a real blue chip business option education was one of the businesses of you know i'm sorry i'm going to sound a very a bit rude but a lot of very uneducated were very very heavily invest invested in the education business there were people running scores of educational institutions who in my opinion were probably very very worldly wise so they decided to invest their fortune in the education and education was booming because the world realizes today if you are not educated you don't stand anyway i have had the privilege of having my own child go through you know there's a lot of jokes circulating all over the world it's not just india not just oman all over the world there is a very elite batch of students all over the world called the 2020 batch you know if you are a doctor you can you may be said oh i know you are a doctor very good now can you operate this cat or can you operate this man so they you know this is like i i read this joke it was circulating in the whatsapp so the doc, the student is really like you're surprised so how can i operate a cat they said because you are a 2020 batch you never got a human body to experiment they probably taught you on cats and like similarly if you are an engineer whether you learnt your engineering on the site or you learnt your engineering in your house drawing sketches on a paper i had my own son going through his you know 12th class board exams and my my son he was given xyz marks for a particular paper, couple of papers which was scrapped because of the covid pandemic so i always tell him you are nearly 12th pass you didn't do your last two papers and he gets a little upset of course the young man is studying in engineering in australia and he's doing well so i felt that probably the school has done a good job but the entire education system was totally taken for a topsy turvy ride following the covid pandemic what was the immediate effect after covid you know this is the american in the the united nations the sdg as the sdg policy report can you imagine the tantalizing humongous figures 1.6 billion learners in more than 190 countries were affected 
94% of the world's student population and it's up to 99% in the lower and the lower middle income group country. There, suddenly their careers, their dreams, their aspirations went for a toss. And it is not over. What's happened in 2020, it has disrupted the educational system and they are rendered vulnerable for a significant amount of time in the future. Decades of progress, and this is not my words, this is not my expert opinion. This is the United Nations special, you know, as I said, the Sustainable Development Group report. I'm quoting it verbatim. As I said, I'm not a very intelligent guy, so I don't quote my, uh, you know, my ideologies. I copy from people much more wiser than me. So the immediate aftermath of the pandemic, and this is exactly the truth because I was chairman of a big tertiary schooling system in Oman and for a decent number of years. This is what happened even to my school. The schools were closed. Now all our lives we've been told education is a fundamental right and essential for the existence of other human rights. Suddenly the schools are closed. Who all would be affected? This was suddenly the picture of the classroom. I don't know what was, when did the classrooms close in India, but I think in Oman, the classrooms closed as early as Jan 2020. And this is what was the picture of most of the schools. This is actually a picture from Oman. See such a huge setup and a boy skirting away from the school because the school is closed. They are afraid to let the students in. We've been talking about a lot of things so far, human rights, education, education necessary for so many things. But the entire system came to a grinding halt. So who suffered the brunt? The three shaking pillars, parents, students, and teachers. They were the three most affected segments and which I have had an opportunity of having a personal in-depth, direct, closed eye, closed focus vision of the system. So the parents suddenly, now how did the parents respond? Suddenly the responsibility was outsourced to the parents because there were no schools. So every parent had to sit and teach his kid. So most of the parents, including myself as a father, I was happy that my child goes to the school and there are teachers who take care of my, the academic requirements of my child. Suddenly that responsibility vanished, which was outsourced to somebody. I was actually forced to look into or figure out what my children were studying. Or that means me or other members, responsible members of my family had to take ownership. Life patterns obviously got disrupted. The crutches of tuitions and private collapse. And now, Tuitions and private classes, they are a big support, ancillary support for a lot of people. Those who are themselves not capable or competent or confident enough to handle the educational demands, requirements or queries of their children at home. They have to fall back. If and I mean, I know I'm not marketing private classes or tuitions, but if I am not capable enough and the school is not you know, competent enough to do, uh, totally take care of their uh, academic requirements, it is bound to happen. And similarly, they were also forced to be involved, the parents were forced to be involved in the teaching process. And lastly, when I am supposed to bear the brunt of taking care of all this, a lot of parents started resentful of paying the fees when the schools were closed. This is the reality. These were pictures these are all pictures borrowed from the country. Whether the parents are agitating or the child is being turned back from the school because of being unable to pay fees. <clears throat> now, what happened to the student? They were the worst of the affected. They were the poorest of the guinea pigs in the whole system. Whether it was the junior school or the senior college, higher educational school, they suffered the worst. Suddenly, altered hours, nighttime. You know, 
my 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 son he is studying in monash university melbourne but he study is he stays at salala oman with me because the flights are closed and he's finished his first semester so he does, he runs his college from 1 am in the morning to 11:30 12 in the afternoon and then he sleeps at 2 in the afternoon gets up at 9 o'clock in the night that's his biological clock because his college is in the southern hemisphere and he stays in the northern hemisphere and this this is the live example at home so imagine this is what has happened to every student all over the world our educational institution children even at home school going children school hours changed get up in the morning rubbing eyes sit in front of the led screen of the laptop and try to concentrate imagine this small boy mask around his face gawking into the screen trying to look at and figure out what the teacher is trying you know communication major saab is a fantastic communicating person as i realized while he was speaking his words i was also following his facial nuances his eyes speak more than his tongue let me take, let me give you a compliment major your eyes are so powerfully expressive they they precede the thoughts that come out of your mouth non verbal communication body language you know components they are so important in a live one on one classroom teaching they disappear in a virtual classroom children and then comes the teachers as i said half of the teachers laid off or salary cut so they also finally they also have a living sustenance to maintain they have families they have responsibilities they also stood out they also suddenly a lot of teachers who were for years drenched in a certain pedagogy in a certain form format of delivering or transferring knowledge suddenly they were forced into learning how to run the computer how to get into a virtual classroom how to do online teaching a teacher who would come into the class and carry a you know in india i have seen that still happen in some places they call it a bath you know a bamboo stick and suddenly if he's on the screen dealing with 50 kids and he doesn't have that bath you know which is that magic controlling remote or magic wand of control he is at sea he is at a total loss of confidence you know these are very practical aspects to be kept in mind and similarly the teachers started feeling the pinch because they were not being paid but they were being forced to teach and parents were not paying the fees but they wanted the children's education to continue the owners of the educational institutions or the promoters they wanted their schools to be open but not willing to pay the teachers and not able to collect the fees from the students imagine what a, what a what a i mean strangely dynamic situation it was really i mean i i, I don't have words to configure i don't know how to say i i actually faced that in the school where i was an honorary chairman of the management and it's a community school so the poor teachers i feel really sorry for them job cuts wages slash change up as i said all these things happen to them now whenever there is a you know there are some blessed professions the black panther in this who for whom it was a golden opportunity was the it industry they were quietly hidden in the wings they were making these small scratches on the bark of the tree digital technology ipad bagless classrooms smart boards because i was every week i used to get flooded with you know people coming and going this was like a you know like the heaven suddenly opened the stage was open and it the, the floor was yours and they suddenly they, it was time for them to make it but then when you are suddenly on a highway 
hurtling down on an Aston Martin or a McLaren Mercedes. You also should know where to break, where to stop, how to take the curbs and the bends, how much to unload, because what happened initially when the technology came down is that there was so much of flooding of technology, digital technology. They even that was baffling, confusing, overwhelming, and a lot of people were drowning into absorbing or acceptance of this technology overload. I have seen my teachers, they were looking as if they were moonstruck when they were exposed to the digital technology handling portals. So, over a period of time, now, IT industry and digital technology was already into the education sector. Online teaching was there, virtual reality, distance-based learning. But what happened is over a period of time by trial and error, by you know, experimentation, by gradual acclimatization, gradual acceptance, a kind of mature perspective evolved and a kind of hybrid learning pattern has evolved all over the world. There is now partial classroom, partial online, partial virtual, partial real-time based kind of teaching methodologies catering to selective groups of student population, which is now evolved. And let me tell you, it is going to stay. Online distance, distant education is no longer going to take a vaccine because accessibility, approachability, and comprehensibility has now found some sort of establishment in the student system all over the world. So there was a difficult of transition period. And these were some of the problems like replacement of the sit-in classrooms or physical barriers of restraint, lack of nonverbal communication signals and responses, or accountability and outcome monitoring. But the COVID classroom, which started off in 20, is now definitely a possible reality, an existential reality, and a real-time you know, uh, in, in, in corporation in all future curriculums, in all study patterns all over the world. Just a small request. Let the technology be always simple to learn or adapt. It's good to discover newer, techno-savvy, more versatile, more comprehensive, and more enhancement providing, more upgradable technology aids and tools to make education and knowledge transfer and, and you know, information delivery more suave, more easy, and more versatile. But let it be simple. Let it be easy to handle and manage. Let it be practically applicable and open to customization. Let it be open to updates and newer applications. And most important, let it be cost-effective and utilitarian. It's very important that if we have to move beyond, there has to be two freedom. One is freedom from the mask, that is, what is the mask? I mean, freedom from failure of expression. That is the picture on the right, the blue. And freedom from restriction of expression. One should not sit quiet and one should not be forced to sit quiet. These are the two expressions which are extremely essential if we have to evolve a strategy beyond this situation. In the schooling system, every stockholder or every player has to come into play. The families, the out-of-school programs, the employers, the health and social protection agencies, the community institutions, they all have to get integrated. The school cannot function as an autonomous entity. So coping, managing, this is, I'm going to skip this slide. This is the future classroom dynamics. 
and at least as a doctor as i see this is going to be the scenario at least till 2022 if it changes beyond that it's good but definitely the world is going to be cautious and overtly careful at least for another 365 days till the pandemic is totally laid to rest so then now what does this picture communicate this picture communicates a lot of things it talks about social distancing but it also talks about half of the number of students being able but if the number becomes half the cost of education cannot double the cost of education cannot double then how does the education or the education provider sustain the system how does that the education continue to cater to that half which is missing from those cross chairs who have either lost access or do not have the ability to access or who have had to withdraw their access because of you know constraints of finance or whatever other so this picture though it appears very mundane and very simple conveys a lot of un yet unresolved areas which need to be addressed for sorting out the dynamics of the education system or prevalent all over the world everyone dreams that this would be the ideal situation let's hope it's not a utopian dream i want to say one thing education system and the healthcare system these are two systems which are extremely important education system lays the foundation of human civilization to produce people who will carry the civilization forward tomorrow healthcare system keeps the civilization alive today so it can get educated and move to tomorrow so both of these two systems deserve very special consideration very humane consideration and a very pragmatic supporting view by all and sundry involved in the entire process whether it's teaching whether it's healing whether it's building whether it's creating or whatever i was more keen to talk in a generalistic sense in a generic way than in a specific way because specifically when people talk they get very tubular vision or they get very restricted in their vision to just keep highlighting or keep hammering why this why this and why not that or why not that but i guess the time has come for everyone whether it's a lawyer it's a major it's a doctor it's a it's an engineer it's a teacher it's a fruit seller everybody to realize that we all have to stand together and make the world a safer and a better place to live rome was not built in a day but neither can you play the fiddle like rome as rome burns like nero you all heard of nero the incompetent roman emperor apparently he was playing the fiddle while rome burned i think as i said earlier as a surgeon with controlled constructive aggression and i would request everybody each and everybody big or small rich or poor wise or otherwise to roll up your sleeve and we all have to work i guess we are all done talking and debating you know i saw a wonderful slide of major sub you know education system if the classroom cannot contain 50 students i was just talking to somebody and i was actually planning to start this experiment in a remote village in orissa i spoke to somebody just a couple of days back why can't the school hours be changed to evening hours when it is dark tie a white bed sheet on four bamboos sponsor a projector which costs just about 600 rupees and run a slide and put 50 children in a ground 
with a big screen and run the class in the evening. Education, see, innovative, simple ideas, Guru Gyan, Gurukul Gyan education system. Let us fall back on our rich cultural, educational heritage and history. Take those lessons from the pages of history, which can still be made applicable with a bit of tinkering and tampering. And let us, you know, find a way forward. I said, I'm going to attempt to walk past the ruins. Whether my feet get hurt and my toes start bleeding, I'm not sure. But I guess we are all done with enough of talking and debating. It's time to make a change that we've always been speaking of. Thank you so much, Major Saab. Thank you, Premaji. <laughs> I really don't have words to express my uh, uh, gratitude to all of you for giving time to this person, to me, to a, to, a, to a very ordinary person like me, share my thoughts, share my anguish. I would rather say my anguish because it's really time that we ring the bells and bring the curtains down on this pandemic. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. For thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Devashish Bhattacharji. It was such a, I, I, I would say it was such an enlightening. There was so much of homework. There was so much of input. There were so many ideas. There is a new packaging, new world order, and a couple of things. And I picked up that sentence where your son is taking the classes in the evening. Imagine getting up in the middle of the night and then uh, I would say, amazing, you know, amazing. We have done so many webinars, but you try to pack everything in such a systematic and a pragmatic way. I think each and every uh, point which is relevant and all the time we keep talking about. Now, few threads I wish to share with you if you close your presentation then we will come face to face and we can just uh, talk about while having the Close. closing remarks. Close and uh, meanwhile, let me just convey my deep thanks and gratitude to all my brothers and sisters from world over those have joined on different mode, modes. You have come on the YouTube, you have come on the Facebook, you have come on the Twitter. So great, great thanks to each one of you. What a wonderful. Now, you know, there's so many innovations and creativity, like uh, he was talking to somebody in Odisha and he gave that wonderful example, why don't we run? Similar way, a lot of other inputs have come. Why can't we stagger the school days and school timings and school children's? That few kids, they come for three days a week and other set of students, they come. Some of they come in the morning and go back in the afternoon. Some come in the afternoon and go back in the evening. And some of them, they come only on Saturdays and Sundays. And I believe always, and I laugh sometimes with people, the people who ask for Saturday and Sunday holiday, I always tell them, little crude example, but it is a realistic. We got to take with the life. Don't you go to toilet on Saturdays and Sundays? Do you hold your stuff inside? If you don't hold and you take it out, it means you're putting it in also. And whatsoever you are putting in, why are you putting only the food part? Why not the cerebrum part and the brain part and the education part and the human interaction and collaboration part? That is also very essential. Rather, Saturday and Sunday should be more productive than the other days. Now, coming to the second part, something very interesting uh, when he talked about that, uh, you know, challenges. I'm going to say each day when I'm hearing so many deliberations, the new challenges are coming. You cannot increase your fee structure. How long will you reduce the salary structure of your staff? How somebody will give the quality inputs when the salary is not coming? If a teacher has come over there and thinking about the dry ration in the school, oh my God, now salary is down, salary is half. What do I do? How do I survive? How do I repackage? Because once you start getting a particular package, then you make your expenses accordingly. And it is very, very difficult for us. And that's why if you see the history of Rajas and Maharajas, think about a Maharaja getting down from a car and going on a bicycle. 
they would rather like to commit a suicide that night time you sleep and you don't get up in the morning than to be saying that maharaja why don't you go as a princely <laughs> estate owner on a bicycle he would say how can you expect that out of me similar way if you have increased your expenses the world is getting to new order our chamber has done the whole research basic food basic education earn and learn and your wellness i am not talking about health i will more talk about wellness because you got to have mental wellness physical wellness environmental wellness spiritual wellness and your economic wellness also that part we all have to take into consideration very very important for all of us ladies and gentlemen there is a lot to learn from dr devashish bhattacharya ji this evening and in the audience i found there is a gentleman who served in oman for 3 years he is from the army education core army schools background arumugam shrinivasan ji from tamil nadu and something very interesting he wrote he comes from a city where swami vivekanand ji got down for a cup of tea while coming from america to kanyakumari boarding a train and traveling to kolkata and halfway when he got the, got down at a railway station to have a cup of tea and where he made a statement arise awake stop not till the goal is achieved or goal is reached so ladies and gentlemen wonderful i am so grateful to prema murli dharan ji that she had been very kind like my younger sister and she gave such a wonderful source resource new source and across the tunnel the gorgeous torch in the form of dr devashish bhattacharya ji from oman who joined us and all of us from the world over wherever you are and those who have joined us for this program our chambers deepest gratitude and thanks to all of you thank you very much and on behalf of our chamber on behalf of my entire team on behalf of all my colleagues and the entire packaging of our advisors in 149 countries we convey our deep gratitude and thanks to dr debashish bhattacharya ji for enlightening us sharing his vision and such a wonderful reservoir of a cerebrum and knowledge thank you sir thank you thank you so much sir <laughs> i think i need to touch your feet <laughs> no. as i said aap bade hain you are elder to me <laughs> and you are so respectable thank you sir and and my heartfelt gratitude to you thank sir. you sir thank and you. to prema ji prema ji thank you thank sir you. thank you sir thank you. so ladies and gentlemen green morning green afternoon green evening wherever you are stay take take care of your health stay fit stay fine and something very nice mental fitness is more important than your body fitness your body would follow whatsoever mentally you convey to it and that's why a 4 feet person takes on a 20 feet high jump because physically you follow later first mentally you cross that particular bar so all of us stay strong stay healthy stay fine namaskar and jai